everybody. Today's practice problem comes from Principles of Microeconomics by N. Gregory Mankiw. We're going to be working with the sixth edition and we're going to be doing chapter eight, problem number four. The problem starts with, suppose that the government imposes a tax on heating oil. And then the first part of the question asks, would the dead weight loss from this tax likely be greater in the first year after it's imposed or in the fifth year? So we need to think about what tools we've learned and what concepts we can bring together to start understanding this problem. So we're being asked about the deadweight loss of a tax in the first year versus the fifth year. And so, hmm, what could be going on there? Well, what you'll notice is that we're dealing with, in one case, a shorter time horizon, and in the other case, a longer time horizon. And then you could ask yourself, well, why does that matter? And one of the things that we learned is that a time frame or um, a time horizon that you're looking at actually affects price elasticity of demand. Technically, it also affects price elasticity of supply. So we can think about what that's going to, what effect that's going to have on our markets, and how the effect on the supply and demand in the market is actually going to affect the deadweight loss from the tax. So to do that. We can start by just drawing two diagrams here. One, I'll say that this is what the market looks like in the first year, and this is what the market's going to look like in the fifth year. That seems like a reasonable place to start. And then we could just draw a regular supply and demand for each of these. Have quantity, market quantity on the horizontal axis, price on the vertical axis. And we said in the first year, over that shorter time horizon, consumers don't have that many choices. They don't have that much flexibility. So what we're going to see is that their demand is actually more priced inelastic than it's going to be when they have a longer time horizon. And what that means is basically that for any given change in price of gasoline, the consumers are going to be able to do less about it in terms of changing their quantity here than they will here. So maybe demand looks something like this in the first year, but then demand in the fifth year is going to be more price elastic because there are more options and consumers have more of the ability to change their habits, change where they live, change where they work, change what car they drive, whatever. I think we were talking about heating oil, so changing where you live would really be the main driver there, the type of clothes you wear, how many blankets you own, etc. But you can think about the type of choices that consumers have, and over the long term, they have more flexibility, so we're going to see demand that's more price elastic. And we said that more elastic demand was flatter, and more inelastic demand was steeper. So you can roughly think about the two cases like this here. You could also notice that for a given change in price, if we were to think about a small change in price here, that's going to have a big effect on quantity demanded, or big elasticity. And here, that same change in price is just going to have a small impact on quantity demanded because we have low elasticity. So we could say here that this is going to be our more inelastic case. And this is going to be our more elastic case. And the same is actually going to be true for supply as well, because over a longer time horizon, producers are able to introduce more flexibility into their production processes than they are in the short term. So in the short term, they might be committed to particular ways of doing things, particular factory sizes, and so on and so forth. But in the longer run, they too are actually able to be more price elastic. And we can represent that here as well in a similar way. That in the short run, again, more inelastic behavior on the part of suppliers is again going to be shown by a steeper curve, just this time a supply curve. Versus here, in the longer term, producers are also able to be more elastic, and maybe we would see a supply curve. Again, it's flatter, because more elastic is flatter. That looks like something here. So in summary, because we know that over longer time horizons, 
both consumers and producers are able to be more price elastic, that our, both our supply and our demand curves are going to look more elastic, meaning more horizontal, over this longer time horizon than they do over this shorter time horizon. So now that we understand what our markets look like, we can come back to the question at hand regarding what effect does a tax have on these markets. So what we can do is we can put a tax of the same size on each of the markets and see what happens. So let's say we have a tax of about this amount here. And I were to go over to this market, and we know that our equilibrium with the tax is just the quantity at which the price given by the demand curve and the price given by the supply curve differ by exactly amount, the amount of the tax with the price that the consumer pays or the price on the demand curve being above the price that the producer gets to keep or the price on the supply curve. So what that means is that we're looking for an equilibrium quantity that's to the left of the free market equilibrium, which is given here. And if my tax is this big, my new equilibrium quantity with the tax is going to end up being somewhere about here. So we could say now that this is our equilibrium quantity, our Q star sub T equilibrium quantity with the tax. And this here was our original free market quantity transacted. We could also say that this price here is the price that the consumer pays inclusive of the tax. And this is the price that the producer gets to keep net of the tax. And now, we could do the same thing over here. Again, our tax was about yay big. So now I could put that here, because that's where the wedge between the supply price and the demand price is exactly the amount of the tax. And I would see now, same idea, but our diagram looks a little bit different. Then now this here is going to be our equilibrium quantity with our tax, our Q star sub T. This is going to be our original free market equilibrium quantity. And again, we have our price to consumers inclusive of the tax given by the price on the demand curve at this quantity. And we have the price that the producers get to keep net of the tax, or P sub P, given by the supply curve at this quantity. So we can compare these two. And the first question asked about the deadweight loss. So we want to think about the relative sizes of this deadweight loss. So the first thing we want to understand is where, where is that deadweight loss located on our diagram. So we can just remember generally what it looks like, but it's also helpful to think intuitively about why it looks the way that it does. So deadweight loss is that friction or that amount of value that goes into an economic black hole once a tax or other regulations put in place. So we can think about here when we have a tax in place, deadweight loss is arising because there used to be units that were profitable for both the consumer and the producer to trade, but that the tax is preventing from being traded. So you can say, well, where does that happen graphically? Well, it happens on those units between the quantity transacted when we have the tax in place and the original free market quantity. Because if you think about it, it used to be the case that consumers and producers were trading all of the units where the consumer valued the unit, the valuation given by the demand curve, more than it cost to produce, which is given by the supply curve. So there was a profitable price for these units in this region here that the consumer and producer would voluntarily trade at. But then the tax is making that not possible because there's no price where the consumer's both willing to cover the producer's costs and pay the amount of the tax. So all of a sudden those transactions don't happen. And we can think about what is the, you know, sort of the opportunity cost of that value. And the opportunity cost of that value is just the difference between the valuation to the consumer and the valuation to the producer, because that was the amount of value they were getting before that they're no longer getting because the tax prevented that transaction. So we can see here that the deadweight loss is equal to the area of this triangle here. And similarly, 
the dead weight loss for the same exact reason is equal to the area of this triangle here. Now I've drawn this in a pretty extreme way, so it's pretty obvious which triangle is bigger, right? That this triangle looks a lot bigger than this triangle. So the simple answer to the question is that more dead weight loss is created by this tax in the fifth year or, or over a horizon of five years than is created in the first year or over a horizon of one year. We can be a little bit more precise about this rather than just looking at the different size of the triangles and sort of eyeballing it. We can think about what the equation for the size of this dead weight loss would actually be. And what we notice here, when we have, at least when we have straight line supply and demand curves, right, that we get a dead weight loss that is a triangle. And we know that the area of a triangle is one half times the base of the triangle times the height of the triangle. So if we were to draw the base and the height of the triangle in a way that was convenient given the quantities that we're showing, we could actually say the dead weight loss was equal to one half times, well if we think about this triangle sideways, the amount T would be the base of the triangle. And then the height would be the horizontal distance that the triangle covers. Because we can define base and height basically however we want, but the important point is that the base and the height have to be perpendicular to one another when we're looking at a triangle. So here, if we define the base as T, we get that the dead weight loss, or the area of this triangle, is actually just equal to 1 half times T times this horizontal distance, which if we look at how we labeled this here, is just the difference between the free market quantity and the quantity once the tax is put in place. So we could say this is 1 half t times q star minus q star sub t. And we could notice from this, this gives us a little bit more detail or a little bit more insight, is that in both cases, 1 half is still equal to 1 half. In both cases, the size of our tax was the same, because that's how we set up the problem. So the thing that's causing the differences between the size of the triangles is how much the quantity transacted changed once we put the tax in place. And not surprisingly, more elastic supply and demand is going to make the quantity decrease more when a tax is put in place. And more inelastic supply and demand is going to make the quantity decrease less when a tax is put in place. And from that, we can look at this and say, oh, look, when we have this first year, these more inelastic markets, this quantity is going to be smaller, so dead weight loss is going to be smaller. And when we have our fifth year, or our more elastic supply and demand, this difference is going to be bigger, so our dead weight loss is going to be bigger. And this isn't entirely surprising, given the intuitive definition that we gave for dead, for dead weight loss where we said that dead weight loss was happening because there were units that used to be profitable to buy and sell that aren't anymore. So it's not surprising that the more of those units there are, the more dead weight loss is created with the tax. Part B of the question asks, would the revenue collected from this tax likely be greater in the first year after it's imposed or in the fifth year? So again, we can use the same diagrams and the same reasoning to think about what's going on here. And it's important to understand, again, graphically, where government revenue is on our diagram. And we know, so here we have a formula for dead weight loss. I can also give you a formula for government revenue. That the government revenue from a tax is just, well, how much is the tax per unit? And then we're collecting that tax on every unit that's still bought and sold once the tax is put in place. So the government revenue from a tax is just going to be this T times Q star sub T, because that's the quantity that's still bought and sold after the tax is put in place. So we have this formula. And we can think about what that looks like on our diagram. And we can see that that's represented by a rectangle. 
usually things that have two things multiplied together are represented by rectangles, just because the area of a rectangle is length times width. And you can notice here, this rectangle, one dimension is the amount of the tax, like we said. And the other dimension, since it goes from here out to here, is the quantity transacted once the tax is put in place. So we can say that the area of this rectangle is actually our government revenue. Similarly, we can say that the area of this rectangle here represents our government revenue in this market. So in order to compare this, what we'll notice, and we want to think about how these markets compare to one another. And if we're looking at a one-year time horizon versus a five-year time horizon for the same market, it stands to reason that this original Q star would be the same in both of the markets. So if we were going to think about that, then it would follow that this Q star sub T here should be bigger than this Q star sub T here, simply because it decreased from the original quantity transacted, more here resulting in a smaller number, and less here resulting in a larger number. So if we're saying that the quantity still being transacted is larger over here, or larger in the first year situation, than it is in the fifth year situation, then it also stands to reason that the government revenue collected is going to be larger in the first year situation than in the fifth year situation. Or alternatively, taking a one year time horizon on looking at what government revenue is going to be results in a higher estimate for government revenue than taking a five year time horizon regarding what government revenue is going to look like. And again, this shouldn't be totally surprising because as more consumers have the ability to change their behavior, to change their quantity transacted, they're going to be essentially running from the tax. And if more people are able to run away from the tax by just not transacting the heating oil in the first place, the government's going to be able to collect less money from that tax.